On May 9, 1807, John Norville wrote Thomas Jefferson a letter. Mr. Norville believed that he would soon become a newspaper publisher and wanted some advice from the third president of the United States about his, quote, opinion of the manner in which a newspaper to be most extensively beneficial should be conducted, close quote. In another example of what we can learn from history, Jefferson's response could be an open letter to America today, not just to the media, but to all Americans. So let me review this letter with the American people. Next on the Constitution Study. There's one thing you have to know wherever you make your stay. Came from a long through line of everyday Americans. Hello there, everyday Americans. Paul Engel here once again with the Constitution Study, where we read and study the Constitution. We teach the rising generation to be free. I am so glad you could join me. I love to hear from people when they, they engage with the podcast, with the videos, with the articles. And today should be an interesting one. There seems to be a series going on. I hadn't planned it that way, but we're looking at historical documents, and this should be a good one. As always, please head over to that website, constitutionstudy.com, that you can find everything that we're working on. Find out where I'm going to be speaking. Invite me to come speak at one of your events. Maybe look at the store and see if there's something you might find interesting. Please sign up for the newsletter. That's where we're going to be one of the first to find out what's going on at the Constitution study. Uh, basically, it's the scholars and the people on the newsletter that get the first dibs on what's coming up in the future. But also, you can check the box and you can have these materials delivered directly to your inbox when they're published. We don't have to worry about algorithms. We don't have to worry about AI. I send them directly from my system to you, and uh, we cut out the middleman. So with that, let's take a look at this letter from John Norville. In his letter, John Norville asked the president for his recommendations for an elementary work on how to organize a society into a civil one. Now, the first two paragraphs of Jefferson's reply related to this request, and since it's not relevant to today's discussion, we're going to skip over that part of Jefferson's letter. And we're going to pick up with his response on how a newspaper should conduct itself. Quote, to your request of my opinion of the manner in which a newspaper should be conducted so as to be most useful, I should answer by restraining it to true facts and sound principles only. How did our third president think a newspaper should conduct itself? By restraining it to true facts and sound principles only. Now, that sounds reasonable. In fact, most of the news outlets have a motto that could be seen as promoting this very idea. But just as today, news in the 19th century... Well, it was not a pretty business. Yet I fear such a paper would find few subscribers. It is a melancholy truth that a suppression of the press could not more completely deprive the nation of its benefits than is done by its abandoned prostitution to falsehood. Nothing can now be believed which is seen in a newspaper. Truth itself becomes suspicious by being put into that polluted vehicle. The real extent of this state of misinformation is known only to those who are in situations to confront facts with their knowledge of the lives of the day. Based on what I've seen in the media over my lifetime, I also doubt that any news outlet dedicated solely to true fact and sound principles would last very long. Even the idea of true facts seems inconceivable to many Americans today in our society where that's your truth, but not mine. What is true facts? If you wanted to deprive a nation of the benefits of a free press, which would be more effective, to suppress the press or simply abandon it to the prostitution of falsehood? And just as the boy who cried wolf, the media's reputation for falsehood brings into suspicion any truth they may actually report. Should Fox News or CNN report that the sky is blue, I am sure there are those out there who would not believe them. The media has so prostituted itself to an ideology that they cannot even conceive of a different point of view. And where people used to go into journalism to find the truth, today young students are more interested in changing the world than reporting on it. Now, prostitution is defined in Webster's 1828 dictionary as, quote, the act of setting oneself to sale or offering oneself to infamous employments as a prostitution of talents or abilities. Has the modern news media sold itself? Has it offered its work for infamous employments? Does anybody remember Dan Rather's famous assertion, quote, even if the documents are false, the underlying story is true? 
I know I don't believe anything I read, hear, or see from the news media. I assume everything is biased until proven otherwise. Why? Because they have proven themselves to be the polluted vehicle Jefferson talked about. I cannot count the number of times I've gotten some piece of information from the news media or, or followed up on some article posted on social media only to research it and find the information was incomplete at best and a complete fabrication at worst. Neither can I count the number of articles I've had to throw in the trash heap as I found the information I had gotten from some media outlet to be inaccurate. I have weighed the media of all stripes and persuasions only to find them wanting. Why do I vet every piece of information I get from the media before I use it here or make a decision in my life based on it? For the same reason Jefferson would have. I really look with commiseration over the great body of my fellow citizens who, reading newspapers, live and die in the belief that they have known something of what has been passing in the world in their time. Whereas the accounts they have read in newspapers are just as true a history of any other period of the world as of the present, except that the real names of the day are affixed to their fables. General facts may indeed be collected from them, such as that Europe is now at war, that Bonaparte has been a successful warrior, that he has subjected a great portion of Europe to his will, etc., etc., but no details can be relied on. I will add that the man who never looks into a newspaper is better informed than he who reads them, inasmuch as he who knows nothing is nearer to the truth than he whose mind is filled with falsehoods and error. He who reads nothing will still learn the great facts and the details are all false. What a sad state of affairs it is when believing what journalists report makes you less informed than not. Sure, you may get general facts from these reports in the same way you might from a common observation. But if the facts provided, if the details cannot be trusted, are you really better off? Sure, Dan Rather's falsehood was over a dozen years ago, but what about today? Have the facts about COVID-19 these so-called journalists touted survived the light of day? The New York Times promotes a completely fictional view of American history in its 1619 project, and not only is it swallowed as gospel by many of us, it is now being taught in our schools. CNN, Fox News, and MSNBC all report on the same event, yet all state different facts. And all of them with the air of authority that can only come from an unwavering belief that you cannot possibly be wrong. And the American people consume this nonsense with great abandon. Has germinalism become just another soap opera? Do Americans pick their favorite show, root for their favorite actors, and suspend their disbelief at the utter nonsense of it all? What are we to do? Perhaps an editor might begin a reformation in some such way as this. Divide his paper into four chapters, heading the first truths, second probabilities, third possibilities, fourth lies. The first chapter would be very short, as it would contain little more than authentic papers and information from such sources as the editor would be willing to risk his own reputation for their truth. The second would contain what, from a mature consideration of all circumstances, his judgment should conclude to be probably true. This, however, should rather contain too little than too much. The third and fourth should be professedly for those readers who would rather have lies for their money than the blank paper they would occupy. I remember the days when there was a distinction, a delineation between the news and opinion sections. Now, I'm not naive enough to believe that the two spheres never crossed, but there was at least an attempt to present the news without the opinions of those reporting it. To segregate the paper, magazine, or news program into sections separating facts from probabilities and possibilities. When the fact that the news section of a paper was expected to lose money, to be supported by the other sections, because getting the news out accurately and with attention to detail was important, not today. Today, rumor is promulgated as fact, theory is reported as proof, and the need to be first outstrips any concerns about being correct. It can truly be said that a falsehood can travel around the world before the truth has gotten its pants on. Such an editor, too, would have to set his face against the demoralizing practice of feeding the public mind habitually on slander and the depravity of taste which this nauseous ailment induces. Defamation is becoming a necessary of life.
insomuch that a dish of tea in the morning or evening cannot be digested without this stimulant. Even those who do not believe these abominations still read them with complacence to their auditors, and instead of the abhorrence and indignation which should fill a virtuous mind, betray a secret pleasure and the possibility that some may believe them, though they do not themselves. It seems to escape them that it is not he who prints, but he who pays for printing a slander, who is its real author. Now, should any newspaper, magazine, radio, or television program actually divide itself into the sections Jefferson suggests, I doubt anyone would follow them. We have become such a rabid consumers of propaganda, we have lost the taste for news. We cannot consume the nutritious vegetables of news without the tasty cheese sauce of opinion, scandal, and salaciousness. And then we wonder why we are having a heart attack of truth and liberty. And who really is at fault? Is it the news media who package their stories to entice and titillate their audience, or the people who pay for them to do so? Is it those who smear and slander someone while covering up the mistakes of others, or is it those of us who continue to support them through our clicks and our subscriptions? Is it the fault of the piper or the payer who calls a tune? If the gladiatorial motto of the news media, if it bleeds, it leads, has run amok, it is because of the cheering fans in the stadium willing them on. And to paraphrase Malcolm Muggridge, having educated ourselves into imbecility and polluting and drugging ourselves into stupefaction, we keel over, weary, battered old brontosaurus. These thoughts on the subjects of your letter are hazarded at your request. Repeated instances of the publication of what has not been intended for the public eye and the malignity with which political enemies torture every sentence from me into meanings imagined by their own wickedness only justify my expressing a solicitude that this hasty communication may in no way be permitted to find its way into the public papers. Not fearing these political pull dogs, I yet avoid putting myself in the way of being baited by them and do not wish to volunteer away that portion of tranquility which a firm execution of my duties will permit me to enjoy. Now, personally, I have been, both here and in other aspects of my life, the victim of the malignant torture Jefferson expresses here. I have been accused of saying things I have not said, of believing things I have never espoused, and of objectives I have never strived for. And I am yet a small and simple voice in the sea of information available today. While I naturally wish to avoid the slings and arrows that inevitably target anyone with facts, data, and opinions that diverge from the currently accepted view, I stand and suffer them. Not because I enjoy it, but because I value liberty and fear the future I would leave to my daughter should I succumb to the mob. I have been tempted to temper the truth that I have found with the gruel that is political correctness to modify the English language to pacify the angry, and to bow to the idols of what we now call cancel culture. While I cannot predict the future, so far I have stood. Will any Americans stand with me? I find it amazing that over 200 years ago, President Jefferson was seeing the exact same problems we see here today. A media that has corrupted itself to meet an agenda, people willing to consume bad media rather than good, people unwilling to do the work to vet stories because either they, they confirm their own biases or they're just too lazy. Freedom of the press is a very important liberty, and it's something that should be protected. That means they're free to lie as well as free to tell the truth. It is still up to us, the consumer, to vet what these people are saying, and if they are not trustworthy, to not support them. We don't watch their programs, we don't buy their products, we don't click their links. Because when you do, you are supporting these prostituted media. I heard a report on an interesting study the other day that found that the media is trusted even less than Congress. And Congress has never had a very high trust rating. They truly have taken their lauded position and squandered it. They've fouled it like pigs in a sty. The sad part is the American people are still eating it. Now, personally, as I said, I've been able to stand against these slings and arrows. 
and, and it's not because of some machismo or some, some great goal. It's because I love my liberty and I'm not willing to submit it to the mob. And I'm afraid that if I fall, then that mob and their illiberal, unjust, tyrannical control will go after my daughter. You know, earlier I did a, an episode on America's Cultural Revolution, how we are doing today what China did in the 1950s and 60s. We're doing what the Russia did when it became the Soviet Union in the early 20th century. We're doing what France did right after our revolution. We're turning into a mob. Liberty and freedom are being swept away and orthodoxy and attention to what other people say is ruling our nation. I believe it's time the American people stand up. Because if you remember, the French Revolution led to Bonaparte and a war. The Russian Revolution led to tens of millions of people dead and eventually the collapse of the Soviet Union and all the pain that caused. The Cultural Revolution in China led to tens of millions of people dead. And we still see the effects today with Uyghur Muslims interned and re-educated, with Hong Kong being taken over. I have friends that are on a mission in Cambodia, and that country is still recovering from Pol Pot and the Khmer Rouge. Decades later, millions of people dead, the country destroyed. Are we going to see that history and learn from it? Are we going to stand up to the tyrants and say, you must believe a certain way, you must talk a certain way, you must act a certain way, or we will beat you up? Are we going to stand up to those bullies? Now, if you're standing alone, that's a scary thing to do. But it's time the American people stand together. So I hope you found this interesting. I hope you learned a little bit from your history. I hope you can see it repeating today, and I hope it was enough to get you to consider acting based on the facts, not what you feel. And I hope it was enough that you will come back and we can discuss something else the next time on the Constitution Study.